Shalom Chareem, I'm Stephen Benoon, and you are watching the Benoon Institute of Biblical Research. I want to bring you back to uh, the scripture that we had spoke about uh, yesterday in uh, Genesis 48, uh, chapter 48, verse 19. And let me just kind of reread a little bit of this with you, backing up to verse 15. Uh, this is Joseph blessing, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> Jacob blessing Joseph's sons. And he blessed Joseph and said, The God before whom my fathers, Abraham, Isaac, did walk, the God who hath been my shepherd all my life, uh, long into this day, the angel whom, I, whom hath redeemed me from evil, bless the lads, and let my name be named in them. In the name of my fathers, Abraham, Isaac, uh, and let them grow unto a multitude in the midst of the earth. And when Joseph saw that his father was laying his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him, and he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. And Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be, a gra be great. Howbeit his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. Now, we, I shared with you the actual translation of this in Hebrew, verse 19 here, uh, specifically the end of it here, uh, where it says that uh, he will be greater than his brother, and his seed, uh, uh, it, his seed will be the fullness of the Gentiles. Now, we took and went back, we looked at the scripture, how that uh, in Romans, how that um, Paul, I think that's Romans eleven twenty five, Paul actually speaks about the fullness of the Gentiles and that blindness in part would be to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. That's in Romans chapter 11, verse 25. But if if we're looking here at Ephraim and we see that Ephraim, according to the prophecy done by his grandfather, Jacob, says that he would be the, his seed, his children would be the fullness of the Gentiles. In other words, his, his children would uh, intermingle among the Gentiles and throughout the entire earth, more so than all the other tribes of the ten, ten, ten tribes uh, uh, of the ten northern tribes that were that went uh, that were dispersed in 723 BCE and went to all the world. And there are there are doctrines out there where people say, well, the Gentiles are those that are coming back are the ten tribes, uh, the ten northern tribes, and those are the Christians. And you know. I can't say that that's so, but there may be some truth to that. But when it comes to the tribe of Ephraim, there is truth in that. There is truth in that because why? They've actually been reckoned to be Gentiles because they would be the fullness of the Gentiles or the fullness of the nations, as we see in the scripture mentioned in, uh, in Romans 11. Now, here's what's interesting, though. I actually remembered... A particular verse, I was sharing it with my wife this morning over in Jeremiah 31. And this is after God's anger against, uh, against Ephraim. And of course, Ephraim actually represented the whole house of Israel uh, for the northern nations. It was a leading tribe there. But still, remember, God's not talking about that through the blessing here. It's not because his brethren would go into captivity as well and would intermingle in the nations, but it specifically speaks of Ephraim. And so God says this about Ephraim in, in Jeremiah chapter 31. If you go over, let's start at verse 19, uh, or verse 18. I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself, thus has, uh, uh, thou hast chastened me. This is what Ephraim was saying. And I was chastised. As a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke, turn thou me, and I shall be turned. For thou art the Lord my God. Surely after that I was turned, I repented. After that I was instructed, I smote upon my thigh. I was ashamed, yea, even confounded, because I did bear the reproach of my youth. And then in verse 20, it says here, God speaking now, he says, Is Ephraim my dear son? 
Is he a pleasant child? For since I spoke against him, I do earnestly remember him still. Therefore, my bowels are troubled for him. I will surely have mercy upon him, saith the Lord. Imagine that. Now, here's what's interesting. How does he have mercy upon him? If you remember when the 12 tribes in, um, if we go back to say Genesis or Leviticus there, when the 12 tribes are, are actually mentioned uh, by Moses, Joseph is one of the tribes. Levi is a tribe. All of the brothers are, tr are part of the tribe. That's what makes up the 12 tribes. But when Jacob actually blesses right here, what we see here in um, in the book of Genesis chapter 48, blesses his sons and said, let, let my name be their name. Then Ephraim and Manasseh actually took the place of the tribe of Joseph and the tribe of Levi. Now, it didn't put them out. It's just their names took that place because the Levites were a priest, uh, the priest to begin with, and they were going to be fulfill the priestly role. They weren't in the beginning, but they would be under Moses. And God knew that. So therefore, they become the priest, and Manasseh takes the place of Levi, and Ephraim takes the place of Joseph. But ironically, if you turn with me to Revelation chapter 7, we see a very interesting thing that takes place. And that is in verse 8, when, when John is speaking about seeing the 12 tribes once again gathered, he says here, of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000, of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000, of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000, etc., etc., and so on. Now, Manasseh is there, and Levi is back as a tribe when you look at all the tribes, but Dan is not in there. But see, because the problem is, is God got angry with Dan like he did with Ephraim. Because of why? Because of idolatry. But in the case of Ephraim, his name is removed from the tribe, but how is he remembered of God? If God says, I will remember him in my bowels, they still yearn for him. How does he remember him? How does he redeem Ephraim? Because Manasseh is still there and Joseph only had two sons. He does it with his own father, Joseph. So when Joseph is put in as a tribe and there's 12,000 allotted to him as a remnant, what is actually taking place there? His descendants now have, have been, there's been mercy granted to them through Joseph. But here's what's even more interesting. That's exactly what happened with the fullness of the Gentiles through Ephraim, where the tribe of Ephraim intermingled amongst the Gentiles. They too came in through Joseph, but the greater Joseph, that is, they came in through Jesus. It is actually Jesus, because remember, Joseph is a perfect type of Jesus. Or Jesus is a perfect type of Joseph, however you want to say that. But that beautiful type right there, Joseph, everything in his life reflected that of Jesus. And sure enough, what happens? Joseph takes his own son's place. So why? So his descendants are not lost. Manasseh can stand on his own, but not Ephraim, because God removed his name in there and put Joseph in his place. It was through Joseph that he was covered. The same thing happened to his descendants that assimilated and became part of the fullness of the Gentiles. It is through the blood of Jesus Christ that, that these what are they? Ephraim's fullness of the Gentiles are Christian believers. And it was through Joseph, the greater Joseph, it's through Christ that you have come in. Now, again, let me say this because a lot of people will get it mixed up. I do believe that there are Gentiles that are coming in through the blood of Jesus Christ as well that have nothing to do with Ephraim. But you do have to remember what, you know, just like when I was saying the other day, I read you that scripture where God says he had sent many fishers out. And Jesus says to his apostle, I'll make you fishers of men. He tells the apostles, go only unto the lost house of Israel. You see, 
Jesus was very concerned about his people because they paid an ultimate price in order for the gospel to go to the world. And the gospel has gone to the entire world. Now, I said I wanted to tell you something before closing here. I asked you to remind me. That was kind of funny. But, uh, but anyway, uh, there's a lot of people that believe that two witnesses are already here. And I would say this. If they are here, the chances of them knowing it are probably next to nothing. If it is they're anointed are going to be anointed of that spirit because the scripture plainly says that the two witnesses their ministry is exactly three and a half years according to the old Jewish calendar okay three and a half years not a day before not a day after their ministry is to Israel it is to the nations for judgment it is to Israel for mercy both the house of Israel and the house of Judah and but yet, I get comments. In fact, I had one. I didn't approve it as of yet. A, a brother wrote me, and I'm sure he's very sincere in his heart. He says, Elijah is already here, and he's gathering back the, tribes of, uh, the tribe of Ephraim and bringing them to Israel. It's not scriptural. It's not the way God does it. When, he, when Moses and Elijah come on the scene, their ministry will be exactly three and a half years. And believe me, it, it won't be a separate work. It won't be over here, somebody doing a little bit of this. I mean, I get people to tell me they're Moses or Elijah and they're bringing out plagues and stuff like that. No, that's not it. So let me just caution you. It's kind of like Jesus said about many will come in my name saying that they are the Christ. But he said, believe it not. You know, the word Christ is anointed. And do you know that even in the scripture, I believe it's Obadiah. Let me just read this for you because it's really interesting. Um, it'd probably be better to read it in Hebrew. So let me just take you back to it in Hebrew here uh, because you don't see it in English uh, the way you see it in Hebrew because they didn't translate it uh, the, 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 way that, the way we see here. Yeah. Uh, you probably see the, uh, uh, at verse 21, and, de and deliverers shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. It is in the plural, correct? In the Hebrew translation I have, and Savior shall come uh, up on Mount Zion. But the word used there is not deliverers, nor is it saviors. It says, Ve'alu Moshi'im. See? Moshi'im. Moshiach is the Messiah, or anointed one. This one here, Moshiim, you know, you could, you could translate it saviors or anointed ones come up. And it's more than one. So it's not Yeshua coming, but it is, they come up, Becha Zion. These deliverers are your two witnesses that come up on Mount Zion. So even the ministry looks like, and I, that's just, again, a conjecture, it looks like their ministry will begin on Mount Zion. It'll just be interesting to see what happens as far as in the future with that. But one thing's for sure. You remember how the Bible says, come out of her, my people, be not partakers of, us, of her sins? When God speaks about his people, mostly he's speaking about Israel. There again, that may be another issue about the, the, the Ephraim being the fullness of the nations because they're all tied up in a bunch of churches. Now, when we say that there about Ephraim, that's not the same as the 12,000 from the tribe of Ephraim that come back to be sealed. Because that number is like the sands of the sea that Ephraim have, those descendants that intermingled amongst the nations. Those are your...